this Sunday morning. It's been a while since I've preached on Sunday morning. I think the, the last time I was here was uh, back in January uh, to start off the, the new year with a series on spiritual friendship. Remember that series? And um, since then, from January to March, uh, we've been uh, hosting this once a month uh, on a Saturday morning um, gathering for our leaders uh, on and, and kind of convening around the topic of uh, spiritually and emotionally sustainable leadership. And today's message is going to be a bit of a continuation of those conversations from Monday, uh, from January to March. And if, if any of this resonates, uh, you're more than welcome to consider to uh, join us uh, next year when we uh, do that uh, gathering again. And um, I'm actually going to be teaching a lot of this content uh, selfishly because uh, I need to put it together anyway uh, as a summer course uh, next month at Regent College. Uh, we're up in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I went to seminary 18 years ago and where Lydia was born. And Lydia is actually coming up and uh, instead of being born this time in Vancouver, she's uh, going to the University of British Columbia for a uh, campus visit. So it's really fun, kind of uh, meaningful uh, personally and, um, and all that. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking a lot about sustainability and what that means, uh, what that means in our church, um, and what it means for our leaders uh, and our pastors. Um, and, uh, and you don't have to agree with me on this, but um, I believe that there are just too many church growth models that are fundamentally exploitative, right? They're, they're built on the exploitation of pastors and or leaders and or volunteers. And they're not fundamentally sustainable unless if they're taking advantage of people, you know, out, uh, out of their own goodwill. And, um, and that's not consistent with the values of the Christian faith. It, it doesn't cultivate mature disciples. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not sustainable. Like you need to keep recruiting new leaders because the old leaders keep burning out over and over again. So we're not about that here, and we're on a journey of figuring out what a sustainable church might look like, even in our context, even in the culture such as ours. And, and the starting point of this for our church is this belief, this value, that we want everyone to grow in, in, in more maturity in their faith, including our leaders and our pastors. So the leaders and the pastors, their existence is not just to serve. They're, they're here also to be in community and to grow. We want everyone to be cared for in this church, including our leaders and our pastors. And we want everyone to be pastored, including our leaders and including our pastors. And part of what happened during this year's uh, sustainable leadership gathering was uh, the, the space just got uh, created. It wasn't totally intentional, but it, it was there, where uh, a lot of us started to become, uh, we were honest with ourselves about some of our past church experiences and how some of our past church experiences, past experiences in other Christian communities and other Christian ministries, how that shapes where we are at in our relationship with God today. And as we continued this conversation, we important, more important, perhaps more, just as importantly, dived into this follow-up question, which is this, well, where do we go from here? How do we continue to grow and trust God with greater depth and maturity, taking into account, not denying, not pretending that it doesn't exist, all that we have learned and all that we've experienced on our, along the way, including both our positive experiences at church as well as our not-so-positive experiences at church? And for many reasons, I believe that our church is on a journey of reconstruction. This has been a theme, uh, a prominent theme this year. For many of us, and just coming to church is a big deal that required a major act of faith. Several of us here in this room, and who aren't and probably on vacation, we'll see them next week in the you know, future, that's totally cool. And I want to let you know that we see that. In fact, many of us have walked there, and many of us are still walking there, and um, I'd love to walk, for us to walk together. We're on, also on a journey of learning how to heal, learning how to forgive, and learning how to grieve, and learning how we can continue to follow and trust Jesus with greater wisdom and maturity 
in community, and over the long haul. And when I reflect on my own journey, this question of reconstruction on, you know, this question of how we get up after we fall, how we heal after we've been hurt, how we not lose heart after we've been disappointed. This has been a central orienting question for, in my life for the last few decades. Um, for, for those of you who may not be as familiar with uh, my life story, um, I was a pastor first, then I was a software engineer and a social worker as well. I've worn lots of different hats, but I was a, I was a pastor first, and um, before I came, became a psychologist, and, and I think it's fair to say that I'm a psychologist today because of what I saw and experienced as a pastor. And for a time, my journey to led me to study psychology after I completed seminary because I wanted to know the means and the processes that people follow to heal emotionally. I wanted to understand why some people, after they're hurt, uh, continue this journey of healing while others maybe do not seem to continue this journey. I wanted to look what healing actually looked like in real life. And I also wanted to know how I can participate in healing, not, not only my own healing process, but also in other people's healing journeys. And perhaps it's accurate to say that my shift several decades ago from theology into psychology was actually born out of disappointment. Because what I was taught about healing in my initial faith formation, it turned out that it wasn't very healing after all. I found that much of what I was taught turned out to be a source of pain that perhaps made sense for a time, but in the long haul, it caused more pain than good, not only myself, but in others as well. And many of the others that I walked alongside in previous seasons of my life, for example, many of the people I grew up uh, with in church, at youth group, many of the people I've served in different capacities, many aren't walking with Jesus anymore. So this brings me back to this original question. What does a sustainable church look like? And perhaps a step further, what does a sustainable faith look like? But as my work in psychology has evolved over the years now, I'm finding myself making a second shift, a second pivot. One that is recognizing the limitations of the field of psychology, and there's many, there's a lot. And one that is finding myself returning back to the faith that I was disappointed in. Though now I feel like as I'm re-engaging faith, I'm doing so in a different way. And in this morning, I hope to capture a little bit about that process with you all. And I hope that this can be an encouragement to those of you who are wanting and struggling to continue in your faith journey, but incorporating your disappointment. And I want to encourage you to continue not only into your disappointment, but through your disappointment as well. This morning's passage uh, is uh, from Hosea chapter 11. And the theme of this passage is Yahweh's disposition to heal and forgive despite Israel's ingratitude. And I would also add Israel's ongoing betrayal. When I think of all the different ways that God participates in healing, you know, I think I have a Pentecostal background. I think of miraculous supernatural healings, which I was, uh, I've uh, borne witness to uh, myself. I also think of how God restores communities, how he restores generations and lineages. I also think about how God mends broken relationships between people and the land that they live in, how God heals the whole self, body, mind, soul, and spirit. And today, we're going to be looking at healing from a slightly different angle. You know, much of my research has to do with spiritual formation. Like, what are the indicators? What are the signs that someone has been spiritually formed? What are the signs that somebody is spiritually mature? How can you tell the difference between someone who possesses the substance of spiritual maturity and someone who's just doing really good at playing the part? So, along a similar vein, the question that I would like to ask you this morning, and I, I know I can be annoying when I preach because I invite you guys to discuss stuff in small groups, and I'm going to do that, but feel free to not do that if you're not comfortable, so, but, but only if you're comfortable with a few people next to you. Welcome to discuss this. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And the question I have for you is this. How can you tell whether, whether someone has made progress in their journey towards healing? What are the indicators or the signs that someone is, again, making progress towards healing and recovery 
from things like hurt, betrayal, and disappointment. You don't have to share personally, but maybe theoretically. Like, what, what have you seen, and what, what do you suspect this might be? If you're comfortable doing this, discuss for a few minutes, and we'll come back together. Go ahead. Okay, let's come back together. Let's come back together. It sounds like we have a lot to talk about when it comes to this question. Um, <clears throat> I would like to suggest that one of the signs of healing isn't that all the hurt magically disappears. That's not a sign that we're making progress in healing. In fact, if someone claims that it all magically disappeared soon afterwards, my psychologist hat comes on and I go, 
something's going on here. <laughs> something's off. Is there one or two people that might be open to sharing? If not, that's totally okay. I'm not going to uh, make us feel uncomfortable and force anyone to share. But just in case there's one or two, because I'm really curious and nosy about what you guys talked about. Is there anyone that might be open to sharing what you guys talked about? Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. And what I'm hearing is um, a, a journey of learning how to hold your pain. And that's a wonderful example of how to hold pain. Is there any other thoughts or ideas? It's a lot better than, oh, you should just forgive and forget. Yes, Ruthie. Yeah, we need to practice that in youth as well as adults. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, keep going. Just the ability to, to acknowledge, like, what Ed said about acknowledging that I was hurt, I was mistreated, but I had hope or healing is not regulated by the negative. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like there's a holding of tension. Like, I'm willing to try again, but not because everything happened in the past was okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Is there anything else? This is great. Yeah, Danny. Absolutely, I think that's a very clear indicator. Any others? Okay, let's, let's hold this, and we're going to return back uh, towards the end of our time together. But thank you for sharing and discussing. As we go into the book of Hosea, Hosea is a poignant case study of Yahweh's disposition towards healing and repair, even in the context of not only historical but ongoing disappointment, unfaithfulness, and betrayal on the part of the nation of Israel. And in the first three chapters of the book of Hosea, it's not a very long book, the, this theme is captured vividly within the imagery of an unfaithful marital relationship, you know, where marital unfaithfulness played out in real time between Hosea and Gomer. It functions like a living metaphor of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. But even within this context of unfaithfulness, again, in chapters 1 to 3, we read that God's disposition is still towards forgiving love. That's the first section of the book. The second section of the book, which is probably most of the book, chapters 4 through 11, then takes a shift in tone and it consists of a long series of accusations and announcements of punishment. God's pissed off from, in, from chapters 4 to 11, right? And this punishment that is announced, it's not this blind threat. It's actually ultimately fulfilled when the Assyrian Empire destroys the city of Israel and took the Israelites into exile a second time. Uh, under the campaign of Tilgath-Pileser III from 773 to 732 BC. And this set, central section of the book concludes in chapter 11 with another turn and in, into an equally vivid picture of God's nurturing love, shifting from the imagery of uh, marital unfaithfulness to one of God as parent and his people as children. 
And that is where we're going to start today. We're going to start reading from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and we will end with verse 8. It says this. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the further they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, and they burned incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with bands of human kindness, with cords of love. I treated them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. This is a passage of divine love. And then next, it's a passage of divine frustration. They will return to the land of Israel, and Assyria will be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword will strike wildly in their cities. It will consume the bars of their gates and will take everything because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they cry out to the Most High, he will not raise them up. And then in verse 8, we see another term in, in tenor. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart winces within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. All we have are eight verses here, and it feels like God's emotions and heart is going anywhere, everywhere. Doesn't that sound familiar? It kind of sounds what's going on in my heart a lot of times when I've been hurt as well. Just within these eight verses of chapter 11, we have three themes, divine love in verses 1 to 4, divine frustration in verses 5 to 7, and then again, divine compassion in verse verse 8. And God's divine love in verses 1 to 4 is portrayed as a parental love, and this becomes the basis for his compassion and announcement of a hopeful future later on in the chapter. God loved Israel since he was a child. God called Israel out of Egypt. God taught Israel how to walk. God healed. And yet this child is ungrateful, not acknowledging the parent's care, and in fact continues to rebel. The Hebrew word here in verse 3 for healing, rapha, shows up in the Old Testament five times. The first two times, it refers to physical healing, while in the third and fourth instances, as it is here, Uh, The word healing refers to the the repair of a relational breach, the healing of a relational breach. So when when we talk about God being in the business of healing, it's not just the physical, but it's also the relational and the emotional. God cares about that as well. And we see here, and and we see God's disposition to heal this relational breach so vividly in verse 8 when he declares his resolve to exercise compassion in spite of all the expected and impending and deserved judgment. God says, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? My heart winces within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. But interestingly, sandwiched between God's love and God's compassion are verses 5 to 7. And these verses speak of a return to Egypt, a return to bondage and captivity, but this time in Assyria. Here we have an open acknowledgement that while Israel's relationship with God has not been broken, it certainly has been strained. Trust has been broken. There was unfaithfulness. There was betrayal. And God names that very clearly. He says, the more I called them, the further they went from me. And again, in verse 5, God says, they have refused to return to me. God engages here in truth-telling about what happened in this, to strain the relationship. God doesn't engage in Christmas, Christian niceness here. God doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to put a positive spin on it. He doesn't just ignore it, but he names it. He tells the truth. So what the heck is going on here? In the same book, in the same passage, in these uh, eight verses, We have God's love, we have God's compassion, and at the same time, all of this coexists alongside God's frustration and God's judgment, which ultimately actually comes into play in real life later on in history. How does one reconcile or make sense of all these coexisting themes and emotions that all seem to be in the heart of God and all be in tension with each other? 
Scholars suggest that the book of Hosea actually presents one of the clearest pictures we have in the Word of God of God's personal feelings. And when we look into the heart of God, when we look into God's compassionate and forgiving love within the context of betrayal and unfaithfulness, what do we see? I'd like to suggest that we see ambivalence, mixed emotions. On one hand, God forgives, God repairs, God loves, God is full of compassion, that's all true. And at the same time, because God loves, He's also hurt. Because God loves, God feels the sting of betrayal. Because God loves, He's frustrated. Because God loves, he grieves. These coexisting feelings are ongoing. They do not cancel each other out. They coexist paradoxically. Friends, I have a lot to say about this. We can go all day. But you know, and I know, that I have a tendency of going long when I preach. So I'm going to start landing the plane uh, this morning. And as we begin our descent, I'd like to do so by sharing a few implications um, a few applications of what we talked about today and how it might be brought to bear on all of our own journeys towards healing and recovery and growth and sustainability. You know, when we talk about healing, there's always a context of healing. There's some sort of personal or corporate experience of hurt, disappointment, and betrayal. People have disappointed us. People have taken advantage of us. People have betrayed our trust. And I'm finding in my research that this kind of woundedness is very common and even expected in the Christian life. It doesn't make it any better. It doesn't make it okay. It's just a common theme. So know that you're not, you're, you're not the only one. God experiences this. Jesus experiences this when he was on earth. And if that is indeed the case, let's go back to that original question posed in the beginning. What are indicators that someone is moving towards healing and recovery from things like hurt, betrayal, and disappointment. What can we learn here uh, from the book of Hosea? I had the privilege of flying up to Seattle a couple of months ago to explore this very question with uh, Dr. Dan Allender and the folks at the Allender Center at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. And in my humble opinion, I think they've developed, uh, you know, speaking as a Christian trauma psychologist, they've developed probably the most robust theologically and psychologically uh, based approach to the healing of childhood sexual trauma that I've ever seen. And as one of the five or six jobs that I have, I'm, I'm working with them to begin the process of systematizing and codifying Dan Allender's life work on trauma healing. And during our last meeting, we spent an entire afternoon asking this very question, and this is what we came up with. Healing is not about finding a clean resolution, at least not here on earth, on this side of earth. Forgiving is not about forgetting. Healing is also not fundamentally about just finding positives in an otherwise negative situation. God doesn't model any of this here in the book of Hosea. Rather, I would like to suggest that healing is more about telling a truer story of our life, one that holds both the beauty as well as the brokenness. That healing is about telling a truer story about one's life, not a more positive one, not a more negative one, a truer story that holds both the beauty and the brokenness. It's not about telling a more positive story. I've, have you met narcissistic personalities? They will probably do great telling you a positive story. It's just not true. It's self-serving. It's also not about telling a more negative story. Um, in my family upbringing, my family culture was, it struggled with rumination and brooding, and that's also destructive as well. And because of this, for some of us, Telling a truer story might ask us, might invite us, might move us towards speaking the truth and accepting the brokenness in our own lives, in ourselves, and others, and in the world. For some of us, this is what telling a truer story would implicate. For others, it would actually suggest the opposite, that telling a truer story of our life 
actually moves us towards acknowledging the goodness and the beauty in ourselves, in others, and in the world. What direction might this journey of healing entail for you? Relatedly, a second indicator of healing that we also talked about is what we've talked about today. The cultivation, and I will add, usually through grief, of a greater capacity to hold ambivalence, to hold that tension that Ruthie was talking about. What does that mean? It means that when we forgive, or rather I would prefer the language when we move in the direction of forgiveness, it's perfectly okay for us to continue to be angry about it, to continue to be hurt from it, to continue to be in grief at the injustice that, was, that caused the breach in the first place. We can feel those things on an ongoing basis, even though we are walking and committed to the path of repair and restoration. The pursuit of repair does not nullify or justify the original hurt. The pursuit of forgiveness doesn't mean I pretend that what happened is no big deal. That's how I used to think. That's how I was used to talk. It doesn't mean that I devalue myself and make myself small. That's not forgiveness. And there's a whole nother topic, uh, but it's also not humility. Maybe at some future point we'll talk about that. Because genuine forgiveness, robust forgiveness, mature forgiveness requires us, like Jesus and like God here in Hosea, it requires us to tell the truth of what happened. It requires us to affirm that I too, that we too, are created in the image of God and we have dignity and worth and what happened should not have happened. And out of the foundation, out of that conviction, and by the grace of God, and I will add, as an act of our own free will, it can't be done out of duty or obligation, we choose somehow, out of the grace of God, to forgive nonetheless. And oftentimes in real life, it really feels more like we have to choose and then choose and then choose and then choose and then choose. By forgiving, we don't make ourselves small. Rather, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu beautifully puts it, when we forgive, we recover our humanity. When we grieve well, our hearts can become bigger than it was before. And sometimes forgiveness leads to a real-life restoration of a relationship, and sometimes it doesn't. It leads to us letting go of relationships. It's really hard to predict one or the other. To forgive is to hold ambivalence. But perhaps the most compelling reason for holding ambivalence is that ambivalence is something modeled by God himself. When we look at the heart of God here in Hosea 11, and I'll end here, we see that God forgives, God repairs, God loves, God is full of compassion, and because God loves, he's also hurt. Because God loves, he also feels the sting of betrayal. Because God's love, he hasn't grown numb and he grieves. Friends, as we build this church together alongside each other and alongside Jesus, let us build something sustainable by bearing one another's burdens and in so doing, fulfill the law of Christ according to Galatians 6, 2. Let's pray. Father, as we are learning how to trust in you again, learning how to follow you again after all the hurts and disappointments of our life, many of which are still ongoing, would you hold our hand, would you walk with us, would you accompany us um, as we learn also to forgive, as we learn to grieve, as we learn to heal, and as we learn to grow. And I pray that um, uh, that your the ambivalence in your heart can hold the ambivalence in ours. We pray that you might correct some of the oversimplified uh, theologies that we were taught earlier in life, that forgiveness is a one-time choice that we can make immediately, that forgiveness is about just forgetting and not dealing with what, thing, uh, what has happened, that forgiveness is about 
saying it's okay for others to treat us, uh, treat us poorly and hurt us. Lord, for those of us who are in the process and the journey of forgiveness, give us courage to go into um, the, the hard places, the hard places that acknowledge that that, that what happened was wrong, the hard places that involve truth-telling, the hard places that uh, validate that we too are also created in the image of God just as the other person. And by your grace, would you walk with us as we continue to learn to, and choose and, and be willing to move forward with forgiveness. And as we walk alongside each other, as we carry each other's wounds, and as we carry each other's hurt, as you do the same for us. In Jesus' name I pray.